Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, Stop the Hidden Profit Killer, Expert Tips for Optimizing Heavy Construction Equipment Maintenance. This event brought to you by Engineering News Record is sponsored by B2W Software. I'm your moderator, Derek Teal, Content Deployment Manager at ENR. Thanks for joining us. When the yellow iron runs, we make money is a known saying in heavy construction, but complex equipment maintenance, uptime, and utilization challenges are a constant threat to profitability. During this webinar, we'll hear from leading contractors about the strategies and technologies they have adopted to cut costs and downtime through a more automated, proactive approach to preventive maintenance. Leading today's discussion is Herb Brownett, president of Brownett & Associates, an independent construction financial management consulting firm. Former CFO of Brubacher Excavating, Herb has held a number of executive management roles at leading construction firms over many decades. He is actively involved in the leadership of the Construction Financial Management Association and is a frequent author and speaker at industry conferences. We will be hearing more from Herb as well as our other panelists shortly. Before we begin today's presentation, please enjoy this brief instructional video on how to use your webinar console. Welcome to this webinar. Before we begin the presentation, I want to provide you with a few housekeeping items. On your screen, you will see a taskbar with icons. Each icon is assigned to a particular element of today's webinar. Click on the person icon to learn more about today's speakers. Throughout the presentation, you can network with others or submit questions to the speakers in the Q&A and chat box next to the slides. Download resources from the cloud icon. After the webinar is over, please take our survey to tell us how we did. Today's event is being recorded and archived and will be available within 24 hours. For on-demand questions or comments, send us an email by clicking Need Help? Email us. If you experience any technical issues today, please refresh your browser by hitting F5 for PC or Command R for Mac. And now I'm excited to turn it over to today's moderator. And don't forget to submit your questions. Later in the program, our panelists will address as many as possible. Today's event is being recorded and archived on enr.com forward slash webinars. And now I'm excited to turn it over to Herb Brunet. Herb? Thank you, Derek. Uh, thank you all for joining the uh, webcast today. And I think you'll find we have a very knowledgeable uh, panel to discuss this. I'm going to start by introducing Matt Cummings. Uh, with a background in transportation and supervision, Matt has been with Banks Construction in Charleston, South Carolina for over a de decade. In his role as equipment analyst, he oversees effective methods for managing heavy equipment costs and utilization. His passion for continuous improvement has enabled the equipment division and all the operations at Banks to become best in class. Our next Panelist is John Casella. John is second generation owner of Casella Construction, one of the largest heavy and highway civil contractors in New England. He helps oversee the growth and profitability of a business that relies on hundreds of pieces of readily available equipment. Through strategies for equipment and trucking maintenance, together with specialized software, they're able to perform projects more efficiently, and he'll be telling us a bit about that today. And our next and uh, last panelist is Dan Corbett. Dan is an AEMP certified equipment manager for Lancaster Development, a top highway bridge and site work contractor in upstate New York. He has extensive experience managing equipment operations at all levels and has been directly responsible for implementing effective preventive maintenance strategies in transportation, trucking, and railroad industry sectors. Uh, just to tee up the, the panel discussion, I'd like to give a brief overview of fleet operations, the economics of it. Uh, I'm sure many of you know this, uh, but just as a refresher, because it's very relevant to the conversation, I'll go over this quickly. Uh, as Derek mentioned, a saying is, when the L iron runs, we make money. There's a lot of content to that sentence. It means you have work to do. It means you have your equipment uh, where it needs to be. And most importantly, it means it runs. 
and that way you maximize your equipment utilization, which is using your equipment to perform construction work. At the same time, it's costly to own and maintain equipment, and you need to minimize the operating costs of doing that. So the success factors we're going to uh, talk about today is first you got to keep the equipment in good running order. It's when you hit the starter, uh, it needs to start and it needs to run and it needs to work as long as it needs to on the work uh, where it's located. You need to minimize the maintenance and repair costs. That's the other side of the equation. And then you need to deploy equipment where it can be utilized the most. And like most things in business, uh, if you need to measure results to know how you're doing and to make improvements. The next thing I want to do is I'm just going to go through a little simple financial example to give you an idea of the magnitude of what the profit exposure is for not fully utilizing your equipment. And I'm going to use numbers, uh, real world numbers from a real contractor that I know in Pennsylvania here. And in our example, this is a D8 cat dozer. And the annual ownership cost, which is the cost of depreciation, taxes, licenses, insurance, just the cost of having it, uh, they estimate to be $36,000 a year. And they need to recover this cost. Now, some people say, why do you need to recover the ownership cost? It's mostly depreciation. Well, depreciation is a real cost. And if you're not costing it to your jobs and recovering it through your contract value, uh, you're doing what the industry expert, uh, many people know, Mike Vorster, says you're eating company's seed corn. So it's very important to recover the ownership cost of your equipment. Now, based on their forecast of work and how they believe they'll use this piece of equipment, they believe they can use it 1,200 hours to perform construction work in that year. And so that comes out to $30 an hour that they will recover uh, as they use the piece of equipment. Now, here comes the great profit killer, unscheduled downtime. It's common in the industry for unscheduled downtime to be 20 to 30%. This is unscheduled downtime is time when the equipment is at the face of the work. Uh, it's ready to be used, you need it, and for some maintenance issue, uh, be it a track pin or a blown hydraulic pump or any number of things, it doesn't work. And so just using the industry average of 25%, if you apply that to this dozer, uh, you're only going to recover $27,000 of the cost of it, and you're going to have a $9,000 shortfall. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but stay tuned. On top of that, for some amount of those down hours, you may have to rent uh, replacement equipment. And in our part of the world, this dozer would rent for $80 an hour. I didn't try to speculate on how much that would be, uh, but it's, it's certainly some value. And then the really hidden cost is job site disruption. As many of you know, uh, the uh, performance of our type of work, heavy highway civil, uh, the jobs are very tightly scheduled, you have day plans, week plans, and everything counts on uh, matters for sequencing. And so if you have any sort of job site disruption, you're getting ready to do work, you got people there, you got materials there, and the piece of equipment doesn't operate, that disrupts the job. And that's, that's a cost that's very difficult to calculate, but you know it's there, and my sense is um, it's a big number. But let's keep this simple. Let's just keep it to the minimum impact, which is the unrecovered hours. So you say, okay, $9,000 isn't a lot of money, um, but if if you have it happening on one piece of equipment, that's the average for your fleet, so it's happening on all your pieces of equipment. So if you have 100 pieces of equipment, that's $900,000 a year. If you have 200 pieces of equipment, that's $1.8 million a year of unrecovered cost that's affecting your bottom line over the long term. And you can do the math, you know, take however many pieces of equipment your company has and multiply it by this number or some similar number and you'll see we're talking about some seriously big dollars. So let's move to our panel discussion. 
Now, as with any piece of equipment, whether it's a car or a heavy piece of construction equipment, it's important to perform regularly scheduled maintenance. That's the foundation of good maintenance. And so I'm going to start by asking the question, um, how do you track regularly scheduled maintenance over a large fleet? And I'm, I'm going to ask Dan to answer that. All right, Herb. We uh, actually have the B2W Enterprise system that we're currently using here uh, across the whole operations. We love how it integrates uh, both with operations, maintenance, and scheduling. Uh, we do all our preventive maintenance through B2W Maintain. And I personally like the way it interacts with schedule so I can see when the equipment is available for us to actually get out there and service it without disrupting uh, operations. And then how do you, you know, there's, there's a lot of service that has to be done to these pieces of equipment. Um, how do you keep up with what you, what you need to do when? We, through the schedule calendar and maintain, we load the work onto each mechanic that we have. And every day we critique that schedule. You know, some of the services that are needed obviously aren't, you know, minor services, some of them are large, and they might take all day, you know, for uh, one service tech to perform. Uh, we try to utilize a lot of Saturdays to catch up on maintenance, and this way here, like I said, it doesn't impact the operational folks, and especially with the larger services, but, you know, right now we use the calendar that's in maintain for the drop down and allotting the work for all the mechanics we also have a live feed in a shop, a, uh, a large LED uh, TV out there. It's like a whiteboard. We use it, and it scrolls through all the work orders for that given week, and the technician are assigned to. Uh, the priorities of them are highlighted, and the locations of them are highlighted. Uh, each mechanic's got his own tablet and iPad that he can also view them on, but this way here, it's readily available. And we try to manage, manage it that way so that anyone can see it, no matter if it's a mechanic or an operation guy coming through and everyone's got visibility to what the maintenance schedule is. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask Matt the next question. Do you perform regularly scheduled maintenance in conjunction with emergency repairs? And if so, how do you make that happen? Uh, we actually try to keep them separate if possible. Um, if it's an emergency repair where the equipment has to come in, um, we would uh, work with operations to try to schedule it, um, but normally if it's an emergency repair, uh, we're scrambling to go out. It's usually on the job site, and we're trying to do the repairs to get that uh, immediately back into operations um, and then try to schedule the maintenance uh, at, a, at a separate time where we can have everything lined up ahead of time. Now, if when, when your mechanic's going to the job site for that emergency repair, um, do you have them uh, try to do scheduled maintenance on other pieces of equipment which might be on the same job site? Um, if the opportunity presents itself, we absolutely do, yes, sir. Um, but most of the time, our emergency repairs, we're trying to get it back into operations as quick as possible. Um, so that's usually our, our main goal with those type of situations. So, all right, thank you. John, do you want to add anything to those comments, either one? No, I think um, we follow a fairly similar process. I think it's important to separate out um, scheduled maintenance and emergency repairs. However, you know, utilizing the software um, that you have to to be able to understand whether you can fit in additional repairs and take advantage of that downtime certainly is something that we try to incorporate, although we manage it on a scheduled basis separately. All right. Thank you, guys. So, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to do all this on a cost-effective basis because it is very expensive. And I'm going to ask uh, Matt, uh, everything starts with a work order. Matt, what's the most efficient way to create work orders? Well, we try to streamline it from the field, uh, from the inspection process um, all the way through. Um, and we, too, have use maintain within uh, B2W system. Um, we get the operator to try to systematically submit the inspections and any defects so we can track those inspections and have our superintendent or, or foreman on the job 
validate any of those defects that they found. And once those repairs are validated, they can submit a repair request um, through the system, uh, which goes to our maintenance department. And um, they can add field notes, they can add pictures, they can be detailed um, information that's from the field and goes straight into our maintenance system. Um, and from there, our planner can review those and get with our maintenance manager and discuss what we're going to do, um, put those kind of on a backlog to get with our operations on a weekly basis and sit down and tell them what, what they have in front of them and try to schedule those out. Do you, do you use, um, does your software give you the ability to create standard work orders? Sure. And, and uh, do you find that useful? Um, with uh, with our PMs, we, you know, we try to set up some of our programs um, that this gets triggered through um, the hour meters or, or whatever. Um, those are kind of set up uh, beforehand, but we do try to set up some programs for repeatable type repairs. Um, so all the coding and everything is already set, um, and any kind of you know tools or parts or whatever have you, um, those are already created. Um, all they have to do is generate the preset work orders. So it is very helpful, yes. Good. Thank you. Uh, now, one of the things I, all, all these uh, equipment maintenance folks try to do is maximize mechanics wrench time. The mechanics are uh, highly trained. They're hard to get. They're expensive. And wrench time means the time they actually have tools in their hand working on a piece of equipment and uh, that uh, they have to drive, they have to prepare, they have to do a uh, um, certain amount of documentation, everything. So um, it, it's important to maximize this time. So John, um, how do you uh, maximize wrench time at uh, Casella? Yeah, um, you know, I think what's interesting is a lot of times um, folks focus on the mechanic themselves um, as far as being able to increase wrench time. But a lot of times it has a lot more to do with some of the things Matt just touched on with being organized and having the information that that mechanic needs to be able to be efficient and effective. And it's certainly an area that we see as an opportunity, uh, an opportunity both for inefficiency, but also efficiency that can differentiate us um, and others from you know the the average um, oftentimes in our business the work is not in the shop and you know certainly isn't always in a controlled environment maybe out on a job site but um, it, that creates a lot of opportunity for inefficiency mechanics get into a job and not having the parts they need um, does he or she have the right tools how long is the repair going to take and how far away is the job um, will the machine be ready when the mechanic arrives um, these are all things that can happen that impact wrench time and everybody other than the mechanic um, generally has a lot to do with whether or not that mechanic's prepared. Um, we we face all these issues and um, you know we've been focused on identifying the root cause of what creates it and how do we turn that into efficiency that can differentiate ourselves and what we what we found is that um, we identified that we could only address these types of problems by creating structure and process and having systems um, for our fleet management team to, to execute on, but also creating a culture of support throughout our organization for maintenance. And the process starts in the field with good inspections and um, a good reporting process, uh, having a system for being able to collect and organize inspections and repair requests so you can get at them when you need them and you're getting them in real time um, as well as having a transparent system to plan and schedule repairs um, but i think probably one of the most important things is if you can incorporate those things is empowering your mechanics by giving them the tools and the training to get the information they need to be efficient and in our case our, our software has played a key role in facilitating the process and increasing wrench time. You know, our, our field um, operators and 
foremen and superintendents have the ability to report equipment issues electronically from the job. Um, so we're, we're no longer collecting paper and mailing or dropping them off at the shop or faxing information in. The repair requests when they come in are going directly into our maintenance software, which allows us to simply um, transition those from a request to a repair order which then facilitates the process of being able to plan and schedule. But that um, software component is key because it allows transparency for our field teams to be able to see um, scheduled repairs and you know, have an opportunity to provide feedback on whether or not the schedule works. Um, and I think probably lastly, with, with those pieces in place, the mechanic can see any work that's assigned to him or her um, what parts are needed, how long it should take, where the machine is, if there's other work that needs to be done on that site, um, which has been a huge, um, huge help for us in maximizing repair time um, versus travel time. And, you know, an example of that is, you know, you have a mechanical out for what, you know, what's assumed to be a, a full day project on a repair and for whatever reason, he gets it done in a half a day. Maybe he's driven two hours to a job site. And historically, um, for us, you know, we weren't organized or real time enough to be able to maximize that mechanic efficiency. So he'd probably end up on the road if the superintendent was too busy to point him in the direction or our service manager wasn't on it. With the tools that we have, our mechanic can now access through a tablet any other machines that are on that site as well as all the repair requests. So maybe there's a grease fitting or a hose that needs to be changed or a simple repair that he can add in and, and get that work done before coming home. All right. That was a really good explanation. Thank you. Um, now, moving to more cutting edge stuff or, or an item, um, it's, it's always good to get ahead of the game in anything. And I know one of the emerging practices is a predictive maintenance. And I know you've, uh, you've been working with that, Dan. Can you explain uh, what that is and, and what you're doing there? Sure, Herb. You know, uh, predictive maintenance and preventive maintenance share a lot of attributes, but they're a little bit different. Uh, predictive maintenance goes in a little bit more depth as far as condition monitoring goes. Uh, the technologies we have at our disposal today to pre predict, you know, the life cycle of components is Pretty awesome. I mean, the first, and I'm sure everyone's doing this, but I'll throw it out there anyway, lube analysis. If you're not on a lube analysis program, uh, boy, you should be. It's one of the cheapest, easiest ways to predict a failure that's going to happen. Uh, then there's some great electronic technologies out there, infrared thermography. Now, I highly recommend that. Real cheap, uh, real simple to use. Acoustic monitoring. Vibration analysis, you know, those are all great to anybody that has plants. Uh, but there again, they all need to be inputted or tied to a real robust maintenance program where you can monitor, you know, what the data should be and that it's being performed and look for trends. You know, one of the biggest things I think, you know, far too often we get a maintenance software, we load all the OE suggested intervals for PMs in there, and we think that, you know, we're done. We got it great. And we fail to pull the data out of that program through reporting. And I think, you know, one of the biggest bangs I've seen in my career for my dollar is pulling the reporting out of the maintenance program. And for like equipment, you know, by manufacturer and category, looking for trends. I mean, you can spot, it, they'll jump off the report. You know, if you see, certain components that fail at 3,000 hours, chances are, you know, the other ones are going to follow suit. And so to expand on a preventive maintenance, you know, modular program, we add PMs in for that. You know, if we know that we have a certain piece of equipment uh, with the Cummins engine in it, we know that the water pump survivability rate is 3,200 hours, we're going to set up uh, a reoccurring PM that every 3,000 hours, it trips to have that water pump replaced. So it's not so much, per se, a PM, it's a predictive maintenance PM. And 
you know, that type of technology that's out there and being able to assess that, even if you don't have to go by the yard, you could, or by the uh, hour, you could go by the yard or cubic foot, if, you know, if you're looking at screed plates and, you know, what the wear rate is on them. I mean, that's all data that can be pulled out of there. And one of the other things we do to try to get better at that is any failure we have is we do an RCFA on it. Now, there again, it might not be a four-ball one. It might not be documented, but we'll do an RCFA on it and try to figure out why did it fail, how can we prevent it from happening again, and if, you know, the need be to create a service interval for that component, whatever it might be, line, doesn't matter. We'll create that so it automatically trips, and we'll do that across that manufacturer for that type of equipment. And your OE, your OE and your dealers, uh, the working group is really good with that, giving you life cycles for certain pieces on their equipment. And they tell you when, you know, a, a certain component might fail. And, you know, so with that data, if you pre-populate that ahead of time, you know, it makes a lot of the firefighting go away and, you know, your, your uptime ticks up tremendously. And there again, you know, if you can measure it, you can manage it. So uh, the predictive maintenance so coupled with preventive maintenance, I think that's the way to really manage the fleet and reduce the, the uh, downtime and the collateral damage associated to downtime. All right. Well, thank you for that. That was, that was very informative. We're going to move on to uh, maintenance transparency. Uh, the panelists have touched on this, but we'll we'll go over it again, and, and I'll let Dan keep talking for a minute. Um, why is maintenance transparency reporting at the field level um, so important? I think the transparency at the field level is important, especially with the superintendents and the project managers. Uh, it's funny you say that. Every Tuesday, I run reports and I send them to the field. Uh, one is equipment utilization. There again, I have a lot of equipment on rent right now, and I want to make sure that the owned assets are being utilized to the fullest. Uh, there again, back to you, how you started the presentation of cost. There's nothing worse than renting something when you have an owned piece uh, with low utilization hours, especially we own all, all our own low boys. We can move equipment. So that's my model behind that. Also, what I mail out, email out is uh, prior week, all the repair requests that came in from the field, uh, I sort that by priority and by location. Uh, makes anything that was job damage or abuse jump off the page. Uh, the ownership also gets a copy of all the emails I send out. And uh, the costing metrics, I'll email out to the project managers the costing metrics of the equipment on their job. And, it, 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 you know, I find it very important to share the financials, you know, as much as you can with the superintendents, uh, the project managers, even the mechanics within reason. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier to put a, an explanation behind the cost when when they can actually see in black and white, you know, what we have done. You know, when, when, when you institute the KPIs and you set goals, you got to share what, what your achievements are. And to show that we've re reduced costs by $1.3 million or reduced payroll by 400000 those are, you know, achievable things. And it, it's a victory, and it needs to be shared. You know, the, the good needs to be promoted. You know, if, you, if we're going to point out all, all the deficiencies and the bad that need to be corrected, we need to promote the good. So I think transparency amongst the field, even uh, the shop guys, I think it's imperative so that everyone sees that where the goal is to be and gives them a focus. All right. Thank you. John, I know, and you had mentioned transparency too, but John, I know, uh, I know you're big on accountability. Uh, can you explain uh, in this area how you create accountability and and how you uh, benefit from that? Yeah, absolutely. I think the transition's perfect coming from Dan talking about um, celebrating the wins. And I think an important part of accountability is that when you focus on accountability, it, it 
to Dan's point, it's important to to make sure that it's not just accountability for things that aren't right, that it's accountability for celebrating the things that are working. But to answer your question directly, I think accountability flows through the entire organization. If you're going to achieve industry leading maintenance, um, the entire company has to be involved. Um, everyone needs to be held accountable to clear expectations um, from your operators to the office. And, you know, your operators need to be educated on how to properly run and maintain the asset, as well as what the expectation of them is across all jobs, you know, inspections, reporting issues, um, greasing, whatever your, whatever your processes are for, for them. Um, and I think when you have that clear expectation, the field managers, who are managing the crews need to create the accountability on the job to make sure that the standards upheld. Um, and if those things are taking place, it's, it's critical that the maintenance team then reacts to those requests and plans and schedules them efficiently. So um, those that are reporting issues um, don't feel that they're falling on deaf ears. Um, it also carries to general management, um, from the standpoint of being able to set a clear standard and then the, you know, recognizing whether or not expectations are being met. Um, the office, IT and accounting um, departments play a critical role in being able to support with data and matrix um, to recognize how we're, how we're achieving our goals. Um, but if, I think one thing that's pretty, pretty obvious to everyone, but it's, Oftentimes, the challenge is that if your goals and processes aren't clear um, and supported, accountability and where accountability lies will also be unclear. Um, and I think that without clear expectations, it becomes difficult to operate at a high level or hold anybody accountable to something. Yeah. Great. Thank you, John. Matt, did you want to add anything to the transparency accountability discussion? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I agree with what they all said. Uh, you know, it builds a partnership between um, your maintenance department and your uh, field operations. Um, the more information that they know, the more buy-in that they have, uh, the more information that you can track and look for opportunities, um, you know, and sell it in a way where you're not finger pointing or anything, but you're tracking your emergency costs and then you're breaking it down maybe by crews of where your opportunities are. Um, and, you know, ANA uh, costs are a big thing, you know, we track it down and again, you know, we look for opportunities on ways to improve on that. So, um, you know, and, and certainly developing systems and processes, um, we've created um, operator care standards for our inspections on all our equipment. So we have uh, clear expectations on what those inspections are supposed to be and how that they report those. Um, so all of that goes in, into um, just creating that, that that culture. All right. Well, you that's a good lead into uh, maintenance culture. Uh, once again, Dan, I know this this is a term you like to use. Uh, could you uh, expand on what that is? You know what, Herb? This is one of my favorite topics. You know, I, I learned years ago. You know, as a manager. My lowest expectation is my employee's highest. So I, I feel the need to always set the tone and, you know, and to lead and train my guys to be proactive. You know, when we have equipment run through the shop, irregardless of what it came in for, we do a quick inspection on the overall equipment. No matter what the repairer came in for, I want to make sure that when it leaves our facility, you know, our reputation's on the line. I want to make sure that it goes out to operations. They got a safe, reliable piece of equipment. You know, they don't know, you know, what was wrong with it, you know, what job it came from. They don't care. They don't need to. You know, it's our job to ensure that the piece of equipment they have is going to fulfill their need and be safe to operate and be ready for them. Uh, there again, you know, I'm going to touch on RCFA a lot. You know, that's one of the ways I found to breed uh, a proactive maintenance cultures involve all the shop personnel when you do RCFAs. Uh, let them be part of it. Let them, you know, feel like they're making a difference, that their input's valued. And it is. And, but I think far too often that gets overlooked. 
So I think by doing that, not only do you, do you breed a, a culture of professionalism, but you're making them feel like they got skin in the game and they got something they're striving for. You know, then there again, you know, I like to use a lot of Six Sigma. I've been a, a huge fan of it for years now. Uh, make sure your shops are all 5S and, you know, the, that they look professional. That if somebody wanted to stop by and visit your shop, you'd, you'd be proud to show it off. And, you know, that cultivates that whole uh, professionalism, the culture, and you see that through their work practice. You will see that through their thinking, how they approach everything, and there again, you know, that is part of the reputation that you want your shop to be able to carry. So that's my whole thought on starting that culture. And there again, when you establish KPIs, if you haven't done so already, you know, I recommend you, you pick a few and share those numbers with the guys. Let them know how they're, how they're doing, how you're doing as a department, and how the company's doing. You know, they want to feel as though they got skin in the game. And I think that uh, breeds teamwork. Teamwork is basically what it's all about when you're trying to uh, stay competitive, you know, productive, and cost efficient. So that's my take on that, Herb. All right. And just for those who may not know, can you clarify what an RCFA is? Root cause failure analysis. Uh, you can Google that on the web. There's a lot of neat little tools on there. If you really want to get involved in, in, in it, uh, you can Google a website called Think Reliability, and they have some really nice RCFA spreadsheet tools to use. Uh, they also do webinars that are free. Uh, I would highly recommend that. All right. Thank you. Well, let's move on. Um, it's also important to coordinate maintenance with dispatch and scheduling uh, where equipment is and its availability is is very important. And John, I know it's your company of you focus on that. So uh, do you want to tell me, uh, tell us what you've been doing there and what the benefit is? Yeah, absolutely, Herb. Thanks. Um, I think um, the importance of having transparency between maintenance and um, operations, dispatch, is is critical and i think a lot of it also ties back to what dan was talking about with maintenance culture um you know I, naturally um maintenance departments and operation departments at least at our, our organization was were always at odds and um you know it's it's natural for that to um to take place because they have conflicting priorities the, the field is measured by production Production is not achieved when a machine isn't running, um, and obviously maintenance can't do its work if if a machine's running. So um, that problem left unresolved, I think, can create a death spiral of continually chasing machines and chasing your tail and not allowing either side to plan and schedule um, and really drive preventative maintenance versus reactionary maintenance. Um, and you know when you operate in that manner it it just it creates more downtime inefficiency on both ends you know scheduling and budget issues and ultimately drives additional use of rentals and what we've found is by addressing that natural tension between ops and maintenance um, we could significantly improve utilization and uptime and we did it by creating transparency between operations and maintenance and holding them accountable to working together to plan and schedule all known repairs. And one of the things that we use as kind of a basis for this is making sure that all repairs um, are scheduled out a minimum of a week ahead of time. So as a repair request comes in, we're looking to get it scheduled and have our maintenance schedule built for the week. Um, and obviously that's always changing and you know, you have to adjust it and tweak it. But by being scheduled and having the field teams know when the schedule is is set for, you know, you have the ability to, to work around it versus the, the drop in. And we've seen our utilization increase by twenty percent since measuring it. And you know, we currently um, run around ninety percent utilization in, in the areas that we've effectively implemented the the concept. That's great. All right. Well, moving along, um, 
we, we've heard uh, a number of mentions of metrics, so let's do a little bit deeper dive there. And, and Dan, I know uh, you feel that uh, in order to drive metrics, uh, you need a, a good cost code structure. Can you uh, expand on that a little bit, please? Sure, Herb. You know, I, I agree with the cost code structure. I also, uh, with this topic, I almost fall back to, you know, the, the maintenance module where the component uh, coding structure and subcomponent coding structure I think is really important. I think when you set that up, you don't want to rush into that. That's something you definitely want to research. First, you want to know what metrics you want to measure and how they're going to impact your bottom line. You know, I would, uh, there's a cost code structure out there called VMRS, uh, which has been around for over 50 years. The coding table itself is captive and requires a license, but the descriptions are not. So, you know, I would definitely research something like that and set up your uh, component codes, sub component codes, uh, similar to that, so you actually have really good drill down data. You can't have too much drill down data, in my opinion. Uh, it just you really get an opportunity to see where the money's going, and you know what your highest costs are. And you know it's no different than the, the cost code structure itself. I mean, you don't want to have a thousand of them, but you want to have enough to where you can measure it effectively. And figure out, and like I'm a firm believer of every year, pick three to five initiatives to improve on, and try to reduce the cost of each of those initiatives by three to five percent. I think Toyota calls it the three to five rule, but I don't know. I really don't have a name for it. It's just something I strive for. So that's my opinion of that. All right, thank you, um, Matt. What are some of the key maintenance uh, and utilization metrics your company tracks? Uh, with the maintenance, um, we track the different um, repair types that we have, um, emergency maintenance, preventive maintenance, and corrective maintenance. Um, what percentage of each type are we at and what are targets for each one? Um, you know, our, our emergency is a best of class number. You certainly want to be in single digit numbers but it lets you know exactly kind of where you are um, and gives you some targets to um, drive for and uh, like Dan said I, mean, I couldn't agree with it uh, more is, is having that drillable data to where you know here's my emergency maintenance what are some key areas that's creating those maintenance uh, emergency maintenances um, and being able to drill down and fi you know figure out exactly how you know we can know you know, maybe it, it ties into some predictive opportunities that we have um, and, and where those are coming from to be able to get on top of those. Um, as well as uh, I mentioned earlier, the ANA cost, um, you know, being able to track those, um, just the overall maintenance cost uh, versus uh, uh, IRV or, uh, or revenue, depending on how some people want to track it. Um, and then it all boils down to it's a maintenance cost per hour that you have that you touched on earlier in the in the presentation, um, knowing what that cost per hour is, um, which you know certainly helps with our, with our maintenance and operations, but it also ties into our estimating department to be able to get good numbers to be able to estimate better, uh, to get you know jobs and have better numbers to be able to plug in. Um, and the utilization, you know, we, we come up with our, our yearly targets per equipment type. You know, we kind of break ours down into different sizes of equipment. Um, and it helps us right size our fleet. You know, we can go in and see where we are with our targets and where our percentages are. Uh, so when we go to budget, you know, for um, CapEx for the following year, we can look to see where we are, where we need. Um, and it and certainly helps us uh, right size our rental equipment as well um you know what, what's sitting what might not you know be used and uh, how to capitalize on those uh, the most all right thank you uh we have one more question on here on this slide about uh action items and everything i think we've we've covered that in the previous comments so i'm going to move on um and i'm just going to comment on uh this slide uh, these are uh, my favorite uh, KPIs, working with a number of companies in the industry, including the one I work for. 
they uh, these the numbers in the brackets are best in class results. So the first one is uh, your total maintenance cost as a percent of revenue. Uh, this is a measure of how efficient your maintenance is relative to your volume, and 5% uh, is, is the best of class target. Percent of maintenance hours, in other words, percent of your uh, maintenance time that is spent on preventative rather than reactive maintenance, and 60% shows a good balance between uh, doing preventative maintenance versus a reactive maintenance. And in companies that aren't very good at preventative maintenance, uh, this uh, this number could be 10 or 20 uh, percent. As you go through all these numbers, uh, the range in the industry is uh, between best of class and average is um, significant. It's not percentage points. It's tens of <laughs> tens of percentage points. Uh, uh, next one is maintenance overtime hours. This is the measure of how efficiently you're uh, deploying your mechanics. Uh, emergency breakdown hours, this is what uh, Matt was just talking about and which I started off with, which is 5% uh, is, is the highest acceptable level. Industry average is 20 to 30%, uh, but uh, best of class companies are, are below that. And I know of companies that have driven this down to 2 and 3%. Uh, and, and that's where you get that $900,000 for every uh, 100 pieces of equipment benefit. Uh, and then this last one uh, is also one of my favorites. It's maintenance cost as a percent of estimated replacement value. Uh, as as most people are aware, as, as you go along in the life of a piece of equipment, the repairs uh, gradually get higher and higher and higher, and you get to the point where uh, the machine is just plain worn out, and the, the repair curve just goes hockey stick. It goes straight up in the air. And at that point, it's actually uh, more cost effective to buy a new piece of equipment than to try to keep fixing it. And so this is a good way as you do your CapEx uh, to measure which pieces of equipment are near the end of their uh, useful uh, cost effective life. And if it's if the um, as the maintenance cost is exceeding 5%, uh, it's time to uh, unload it and get a new one. So. Well, that concludes our panel discussion and, and my portions of the presentation. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Derek to field questions. All right. Thanks, Herb. And thank you all for a great presentation. Before we address some of the questions that have been submitted throughout the program, I want to remind everybody in the audience that we'd love your feedback. And you can uh, give that to us by filling out our webinar survey. That helps us to improve our program. And so let's get to the questions here. The first one we have here, um, also in the audience, if there's a particular panelist you'd like to have that question addressed to, just please feel free to include that in the question. Uh, so the first question here is, how do you transfer the cost in BTW to your ERP solution? Well, I can, uh, I can probably take that one. Uh, in in B2W, uh, they have interfaces with um, all the major enterprise systems. So uh, the hours of people and equipment time are accumulated through their mobile field reporting solution track. And then uh, you can do uh, either daily or weekly or how often you want to do it, updates, which that uh, loads those hours directly into your pay, payroll system for people and into your job cost system for uh, equipment. And it does handle dual rates. Uh, that's a whole nother webinar, but uh, if you use a dual uh, ownership and operating rate for your equipment, which is best of class, it does handle that. And so another question I have here is, uh, and again, these aren't addressed to anybody specifically, so if you uh, anybody can chime in who wants to, do you feel the time and money invested in technology to improve equipment maintenance has paid off? So I guess this is addressed to everybody. So if you want to go one at a time, that'd be perfect. Also, I guess I'll take that one off. This is Dan. Uh, uh, definitely, hands down, uh, huge, uh, huge payback. Uh, far too often, 
people look at the cost of down equipment is just what the cost is to bring it back online. And they don't look at the collateral damage like Herb pointed out earlier in his presentation, the rentals or, you know, if you have a paver, we'll say go, goes down in the middle of a, a mainline job, you got to trucks loaded with asphalt material, you got crews out there working. Uh, just the collateral damage alone, I think, pays for the, the, the software and the implementation of it. Great. John or Matt, do you want to address that? Yeah, I'll jump in on that. Um, yeah, I agree, too. It's, it's definitely beneficial. Um, you know, when we first started it, you know, our big thing was just kind of really knowing where we were you know we had a system but our uh, it wasn't capable of tracking a lot of the the cost and and um, the different codings that um, the b2w system is capable of and um, some of it was our internal processes as well but um, you know when you've got a system that can you know drill down into your cost i mean that, that information knowing where you are and then you can actually know where to uh, to go from is invaluable Great. Um, just to remind everybody in the audience, we have plenty of time for questions. So take advantage of this opportunity uh, to get some expert opinions and insight as to uh, operations here and what they're doing. And so the next question we have is, as you implement a technology and the resulting improved processes, how did you manage change with your employees? I, I can take this one. Um, I, I think um, this is probably one of the one of the critical areas of focus as you implement any software, um, even if it's a implementation of a new software, replacing an old um, change is, is difficult. So I don't think that you can underestimate the amount of time um, that you should dedicate to training and getting people on board and understanding how to utilize the tools. I think the other thing that's important is to train often because as you implement, there's so much that is learned that over the course of a year as folks get comfortable with it, you know, there's a lot of additional benefit that you can get out of the software by taking a look at it again, knowing, you know, knowing what you've learned over the course of the year. Anybody else want to comment? Okay, I've got another great, I've got, this is a great question because it's something that we see, you know, not just in, 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 in engineering, but in many, many different trades all over the construction industry. And that's about hiring. Um, John says he's having trouble hiring the right person to implement a best of class maintenance operation. So do you have any tips and we'll take information from all of you. Any tips on how to hire someone who can be, who's a little tech savvy, but also knows about the mechanics work? I honestly think the way the job market is right now, you know what? I don't know whoever, anyone on his phone ever read the, the book, Good to Great uh, by Jim Collins. I really think there's lessons to be learned in that as far as today's technology goes or as far as today's employment market goes. I think if you got people with a good work ethic and they're willing to work and they're willing to learn, I think you have to do a lot of training nowadays. Uh, it's I actually am on uh, an advisory board for one of the uh, county BOCES out here, and I actually will take kids right out of OTEC within reason, as long as they have, you know, the willingness to learn and a good work ethic, uh, and we will mold them into tomorrow's mechanic. Uh, this is Herb. I'll just add, uh, one of our mantras at Brubacher was um, power for character, train for skill, which is uh, exactly uh, what Dan was saying. Uh, you got somebody with a good work ethic uh, that wants to work hard, uh, that has a certain level of intelligence and uh, get up and go, uh, you can teach them things. Um, but we also found uh, there's, there's a tendency to uh, not focus on your current employees, 
and we found that uh, some of our um, seasoned uh, mechanics, uh, who some of whom are are of a generation that you might not think would embrace technology, really got into this. And uh, I know when uh, we were setting up B2W Maintain and putting in uh, preventative maintenance schedules, we had a uh, a uh, mature gentleman who's, who was a very expensive heavy equipment mechanic volunteered to spend the entire winter uh, researching all the uh, major pieces of equipment and what the uh, schedules, maintenances were, and, and what a work order should look like, and putting that all together so we could build it into the uh, B2W Maintain program. So um, sometimes you have diamonds in the rough that are right under your nose. Perfect. This is Matt. I'm going, to, I'm going to agree with Dan, too. We kind of did the same thing here with the local vocational schools. Our HR department kind of teamed up with them to get really involved um, with, with those schools, and um, we've kind of developed a pretty intensive training program here. We're having the same problem here, finding, uh, you know, the, the workforce. But, um, yeah, I was just echoing what Dan said. We pretty much did the same thing here. I think the other thing I'd jump in on is, um, you know, as far as management um, to help implement uh, maintenance operations, I think all of those things apply. And if you can find that, that person with a strong work ethic and somebody that has the aptitude to learn, there's a, a tremendous amount of resources out there, um, AEMP and other organizations that if you're willing to invest in them, and they're willing to take that knowledge and, and apply it for you, there's there's a lot of opportunity. Great. Thanks, guys, for your input on that. And uh, switching gears a little bit here, what would you say, what would each, each of you say is the most beneficial report used in BTW and why? Uh, John, you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. Um, that's a that's a loaded question. I don't know that I have one. Um, okay. I think that the access, I, I would say that probably what what is the backbone of the answer to that question is the integration of the system throughout all operational platforms. And I think that with our past softwares, we were very siloed. We had a maintenance software, we had a job cost software, and so. B2W for us has allowed us to integrate what's going on in the field, what's going on in dispatch, what's going on in maintenance, and can really provide a tremendous amount of value to utilization reports and understanding how many hours were metered versus how many hours were billed um, and a number of different things, but you could really take it a, a hundred different ways. Well, this Herb, I, I would echo that, and it's not really uh, reports. Uh, one of the values of their one platform where you have all these solutions on one platform is you have real-time data. So, uh, for example, if a piece of equipment goes down and a work order is filled out, you know, dispatch immediately knows that. Uh, so it's really not about printing reports and looking at them. It's it's about the real-time data in a, in a business that works at you know, warp speed in a very real-time environment, and everybody's on the same page all the time. You know, the, for example, the uh, general superintendent might be out at a job site and uh, a piece of um, equipment goes down and, you know, he wants to help get another piece of equipment. Well, he can go in to dispatch and see uh, exactly where the uh, similar piece of equipment is, and it might be right up the street at another job. I mean, they're just I, – I can – I could talk the rest of the afternoon with examples like that. Uh, so that's that's, to me, the real value. Dan or Matt? You know, my I have no particular favorite report. I guess each module, my favorite report would be the dashboard report, honestly, for each uh, module of B2W, whether it be maintain, track. Uh, you know, the, I think the dashboard report should be your most critical reporting because it's where all your KPIs are. And at the end of the day, you know, that's the revenue versus cost no matter what module you're in, and that, that's what we're all here. We're all here to make money. Last I checked, I hope. <laughs> uh, 
Right. And I'll have to say with our maintenance department, just for our internal operations, we use that work order listing report a lot. Um, again, just for our internal operations, because um, you can do a lot of filtering down on your work order information, your item condition, um, you know, just all the various information that that one report has. But um, that's kind of more of an internal maintenance report, but we're we're constantly in that thing. All right, fantastic. And unfortunately, that's going to be all the time we have for questions today. And I hope everybody in the audience will please join me in thanking Herb Brownette, John Casella, Dan Corbett, and Matt Cummings for their time and expertise. And as well, thank our sponsor as well, B2W Software. If you have any additional questions or comments, please don't hesitate to click the email us button on the bottom of the con or on the console there. And please visit enr.com forward slash webinars for the archive of this presentation, as well as information about our upcoming events. And make sure to tune back in for tomorrow's webinar, The Art and Science of Prequalification, that's going to air at 2 p.m. Eastern. We hope you have found this webinar to have been a valuable experience. Thank you all, and have a great day. <laughs>